I mean, it's a big crowd. Got so a lot of pressure, Doc, Dr. Adunka. I know. I, um, I'm, I hope I don't buckle under it. Um, but hey, so is the, is, the, is the main kind of audience neurotology fellows or something like that? That was my sort of yeah, it's a, it's a combination of uh, residents, fellows, and then faculty. Um, I send out the invitation to all the faculty who have previously participated, and then all the fellows um, around the country, and then some of the residents here at MUSC also participate as well. Right. Yeah, it started with ju kind of just fellows um, early on, the kind of everybody that was in a similar time zone to do these kind of live lecture sessions, and then it's kind of it's grown a little bit, um, and it's um you know the YouTube like. People, they get a substantial number of views on YouTube afterwards, too. So it's grown quite a bit. Awesome. I always wanted to be a YouTuber. <laughs> All right, well, I, we can, um, looks like we have a good number of people now. I, we can get started. I'll do a little right. introduction. Um, and then Dr. Duncan can share your slides again after that, if you're ready. Um, you so, see my slides now? Uh, yes, not, at, not in presenter view, but so I do I'm see presenting. them. OK, perfect. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, today we're really fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Oliver Adunka, who's the William Saunders Endowed Professor of Otolaryngology and the Division Director of Otology and Neurotology and Cranial Based Surgery at The Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Adunka completed his medical degree at the University of Vienna, Austria, and completed his residency training at the JW uh, Goethe University Hospital in Frankfurt, Germany, and then went on to complete a fellowship in neurotology at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, he's an internationally renowned researcher on hearing preservation during cochlear implantation and on using electrocochleography um, and other electrophysiological methods to monitor implant insertion. Uh, he's been exploring the utility of these technologies as a means for implant mapping, hearing preservation, and performance prediction. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us today, Dr. Duncan, and we really look forward to your talk. Yeah, thanks, Joshua, for the introduction. Thanks for um, allowing me to uh, present today, and um, I hope this is uh, educational and has some value for all of, the, all of you guys. So again, thanks for having me. Again, the lecture is on electrocochleography um, in cochlear implantation, and uh, these are my disclosures. Um, you know, I do like to uh, my, point out my collaborators, Dr. Buckman at UNC, you know, and Fitzpatrick, uh, who we were all at UNC for a while. So um, that's really where this all started. And some of the products are non FDA approved, so I do need to disclose that as well. So as we all know, and I'll, I'll give you sort of a quick kind of um, overview of what happened sort of in my career with all this. I think uh, since there are a lot of trainees on the call, I felt that was sort of a nice way to uh, get this started. So when I um, uh, did my fellowship at UNC and then stayed on, and uh, I really didn't have um, a big um, research plan, right? I had a lot of, a lot of interest and a lot of, um, you know, previous um, kind of projects that I did, and I had this interest in hearing preservation and kind of cochlear physiology in general. But, you know, it was it was clear that I felt I was sort of frustrated with uh, the way cochlear implant electrodes were placed in the cochlea because it's really the rate limiting step of, of why cochlear implants work, right? That's the electrode neural interface. And um, but yet I felt like the, the insertion was this three second um, you know, process during cochlear implantation, which really wasn't very specific. And remember, I was at the time where folks uh, just um, didn't really regard intracochlear trauma as, a, as anything that mattered, right? And uh, specifically, there were surgeons who advocated for putting a Foley, like a pediatric Foley into the cochlea and blowing it up just to get the electrode all the way in, right? So I think we've come a long way. And uh, I always felt that is there a way that we can customize the insertion to the specific needs of that cochlea, right? Can we account for the size of the cochlea, for trauma? You know, and uh, over the past 20 years, we've learned about all these uh, kind of differences and, um, you know, how how different the cochlea is, how different, uh, you know, hair cells populations are within the cochlea, how the spiral ganglion may be, may be different. So I think we've just learned a lot. So, and, and, you know, the initial philosophy or the, the philosophy that, uh, we thought may work is to have a long enough electrode um, that has enough electrode contacts and to record and we really monitor functional parameters as we insert the electrode 
and therefore customize gene insertion based on physiology, not anatomy. And I know there's a big push on right now from some of the manufacturers to uh, customize insertion based on anatomy, right? So um, I, I think that's that's fine generally, but we would disagree. We would say, hey, you, the anatomy doesn't really matter. What really matters is physiology, because ultimately that determines the electroneural interface. And there's several clinical kind of scenarios po uh, possible. We'll, we'll talk about this later. But this was really something that was uh, that sort of came up uh, over 15 years ago, and um, this is what what gave birth of this, this project, right? So, so I had all these interests uh, when I came out um, into the real world after fellowship, and um, I didn't really know what to do. We um, sort of experimented into the operating room, you know, and I started to become a little bit more clinically busy here, but, you know, started slow because I was, I didn't replace anyone's clinical practice. And, you know, I did a few cochlear implants and then we felt, felt like, hey, can we, so I had a lot of time is what I'm saying, right? I had a lot of time into the OR because I didn't have like a full schedule and all that. But we're time to play around in the operating room and just to experiment, right? So the, um, the concept was really, can we take a device that has an ability to record, right? And every cold plant that's out now has um, ART, NRT, or NRI, right? Which is basically using electrical stimulus. Can we turn the electric stimulus off and can we trigger it with an acoustic stimulus? And can we use an acoustic stimulus to record during the insertion process? Can we just activate the implant, leave it on, and as we insert the electrode, can we just play a sound and do basically a hearing test as we insert the electrode, right? So that was really the, the, the premise here. And can that tell us about damage? Hopefully about imminent damage, because when it's too late, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Because can we can we see damage as it as it unfolds and can we prevent it therefore? And can we determine the relationship of the electro tip to, again, physiologic, either functionally or dead regions within the cochlea, right? So the goal overall was a smart insertion process rather than a dumb one, right? Because I would argue right now, we still have to stick the electrode in the cochlea, right? We feel like that was not very sophisticated, but we need real time feedback because the surgeons were not very patient. And um, we need uh, to do this during the insertion. And since we're also creature of comfort, we just want to use the implant. We don't want to have this complex montage where we, you know, put a bunch of cables in the patient and electrodes. We just want to see, hey, can we just use the implant to do that? And really, why not, right? So that was the research timeline. Again, um, 2005, I was still in fellowship, right? Um, and um, what happened is we did a case, right? It's really depicted here. I hope you can see my mouse pointer here. And um, so we went to the operating room, experimented uh, with, a, with that patient, and we recorded stuff actually. I'll show that in a minute. And we just didn't know what it meant. We didn't mean, hey, is that an artifact? Was that something that was that was real? Was you know, we just didn't know. And it was pretty clear early on that, hey, we needed to understand this better in animals. And uh and prior to that, I really hadn't done a lot of animal experiments, right? I mean, during my residency, uh, there were some labs and I was sort of peripherally involved, but but not to that intimate level that that would require sort of to to take the you know take this off the ground. So I collaborated with one of our PhDs, um, um, you know Doug Fitzpatrick, uh, who had an animal lab, but who hadn't worked with gerbils. And I had again some very limited experience with gerbils during residency. And I'm like, well, why don't we just do a, a few gerbils? Why don't we do some on iacook, um you know, application? And they probably let us do a few gerbils figure this out. So we established an animal model, but it was in his lab. It was, I was junior faculty. It was Doug's lab. And um, we sort of took that clinical question. Can we stick something in that gerbil's cochlea? And can we record physiologic responses as we sort of manipulate that, uh, that electrode? And, um, you know, interestingly, Doug had this little micro manipulator from his uh, CNS uh, experiment. So he was working on infrared collicular stuff, but he had this hydraulic micro manipulator that really allowed us to uh, to fine tune the electrode insertions. And right again, we just applied, I'll show some pictures later, right? So we did the animal models. We worked on the animals for a while, right? At least four or five years, just on animals. 
and uh, got some real nice parameters from that. But then we went back to humans. Um, so we started at humans, didn't know what we're looking at, established the animal stuff, and then went back, what we learned in the animal, can we actually look at this in humans, right? And from 2015 on, really, it's all about device implementations, et cetera. So that's more of the um, the translational aspect of all this, right? So we'll talk about these kind of different steps here. And um, so I'll talk more about, you know, the, the, the basic the basic uh, kind of science behind it, right? There's another lecture that talks more about how can we actually use this uh, for future things. So um, there's only so much time, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on that today. So this was the patient in 2005. It was a patient with auditory neuropathy. And as we know from auditory neuropathy, they have a big cochlear microphonic, right? But there's no synchrony behind that, right? So there are no distal waveforms. So, it was nice for us that cochlear microphonic basically equals hair cell activity, right? And it flips as you flip the, the stimulus polarity, right? If you go from condensation to rarefaction, the hair cells will follow that, right? So you can basically flip the polarity. And as we do that in ABRs too, you know, you flip the polarity and you get this cochlear microphonic potential. Back then, at least, a lot of ABRs were done with reverse polarities where you run condensation and rarefaction cycles right next to each other, and that would automatically get rid of that cochlear microphonics. So a lot of people didn't want to see the cochlear microphonics because in ABRs, right, we use wave five to really look at, at uh, you know, hearing threshold, right? We use a threshold search ABR. But it was interesting, so we did uh, just the facial recess, the cochlear implant approach, get to the round window, and these are far field recordings, right? This is a classic ABR montage. And then we inserted the electrode and you see how that whole thing goes down, right? So we're like, uh, this is, uh, you know, if we get closer to the cochlea, we probably get a better signal, right? So meaning closer to the cochlea is really something that's defined as electrocochleography, right? And we all know electrocochleography from our boards, which no one hardly uses anywhere, any, uh, anymore for, and that's uh, SPAP ratio, right? The SP is the summating potential, and the AP is just the compound action potential, really, right? In, in many years literature, it's called the AP. It's really the compound action potential. But really what electrocochleography describes is that we uh, the, is the measurement, and I'm reading this off here, stimulus evoked cochlear potentials, where we isolate the potentials to the cochlea simply by moving the recording electrode really close to the cochlea. And classically, that's defined as in the ear canal on the promontory or on the round window. So if you're really close to the cochlea, can you achieve a better signal to noise ratio? You, you probably get a better signal than what I just showed you, you know, which were surface electrodes on the scalp, right? So, and, and again, this is the Meniere's, for Meniere's disease, we use it an SPAP ratio because it's, it's felt that if you have high drops, right, the summating potential, which is an inner hair cell potential, is, sur is a surrogate marker for the stretching of the basal membrane, right? And if that ratio is off, then you have Meniere's disease, you have high drops, basically, right? And then, um, so let's look a little bit about the EKG response, right? And again, for Meniere's disease, most people use a click stimulus, right? Which is a high frequency stimulus. We felt let's use a, a tone burst. If we use a tone burst, we can we can modify the stimulus frequency, and we basically get the response of the different parts of nerve cells or you know firing cells that are inside the cochlea, the early periphery, right? And if you keep that tone burst, so for example, we take 500 hertz and we keep, we, we, we don't just play a quick burst, but we keep it going for about 10 to 20 milliseconds, that signal will tell us a lot more than if we just have this very brief burst where we look at just the SPAP ratio, right? So again, we keep that signal longer, right? The stimulus longer. So this is the stimulus, right? This is the speaker. This is the sine wave, right, of the speaker, basically. And this is the resulting waveforms, right? So what you see, there's there's no activity in the auditory system, right? When there is silence, as opposed to the vestibular system, right? So no, no, no signal. And as you start playing a tone, right, or any kind of sound, as there's input, 
all the nerve fibers are firing at the same time, right? And that is really critical. So all the nerve fibers that, that respond to that initial burst of, of stimulus, acoustic stimulus, fire at the same time. That's why it's called the compound action potential, right? You see how this goes down, right? So that's the cap, right? This is when this is when we filter the microphonic out, right? But you can also see in the rarefaction and condensation cycles that hair cells, as long as this speaker provides a stimulus, the hair cells go left and right. They hyper and depolarize for the entire duration of that stimulus. And in fact, the cochlear amplifier, which are really outer hair cells, they keep ringing, right? So that's the cochlear amplifier because you see how there's a little delay in all this, right? So, and then, so we have the cochlear microphonic potential. Again, those are hair cells, right? And then we have the compound action potential. It happens when nothing happens in the auditory system and all of a sudden you start playing a tone. They're all, door, all the nerve cells are not activating. So none of them is, is in refractory time. And all of a sudden they fire at the same time. That's the compound action potential. Then you have the summating potential from an ear's disease, right? That's the baseline shift here and that surrogate marker for stretching of the basal membrane. And then you have one, sig one part of the signal that's really hard to understand. It's the auditory nerve neurophonic. That's really just, uh, if, if you play a very low frequency stimulus, the nerve will fire, has enough time in between peaks and valleys to basically fire every time their rarefaction and condensation cycle when they fire. So and that's twice the stimulus frequency. So for a 500 hertz stimulus, your auditory nerve neurophonic, which is a nerve potential, right? It's the spiral ganglion, would fire twice the frequency of that. Eventually that will go away because then all the nerves are refractory and you're not going to have a synchronous signal, right? It only has it's only as a response to very low frequency stimuli. And I can tell you right now, I tried to convey this a kind of basic physiology here in a few minutes. I didn't know any of that when I was became a faculty member, right? So that uh, acquiring that knowledge took like several years. So bear with me. I try to make it as uh, as um, as understandable as possible, but uh, it it gets pretty esoteric at some point, right? What you need to know is that the cochla microphonic is out of hair cells, and the cap, right? The compound action potential is a nerve potential, right? As you would expect. Right. Well, that's the basic of the of the EcoG response. That's a younger version of myself working on a, a gerbil here. There's a little blanket over the gerbil, right? Because they they're pretty small and they really lose a lot of body uh, heat. It's in a sound booth, so this is um, we use these little micro manipulators. They're hydraulic, so and there's a little hydraulic kind of wheel on the outside of the sound booth, and you can move the electrode in and out of the cochlea in micrometer steps. Right, which we we felt we needed, and um, what that would look like. <coughs> so I would look in the microscope, and we take either you know this rigid electrode, which is designed to obviously cause trauma, right, and then uh, eventually we we used so later in the in the whole series of experiments we used um, a flimsy electrode that mostly um, you know uh, are similar to uh, what we use in the operating room during cochlear implantation. But this is a gerbil middle ear. You call it the bull in a gerbil, right? For those of you who haven't worked with gerbils, it's a great um, auditory science uh, kind of animal. You see the stapes, the um, the stapedal artery here, nice, uh, very different than humans, right? If that, if that happened during a human surgery, you would, uh, you would look for uh, some carotid issue. Um, this is the round window niche, right? This is, this back here is all part of the vestibular system, but you can see oval window and round window. There's a round window um, here in both. And the electrode that we had, this animal electrode, barely fits through the round window, right? By the way, this is the tympanic annulus, right? So um, massive eardrum and, and uh, again, middle ear called the bulla. And the, and the cochlea basically goes straight that way. Right, so all the turns are really readily accessible through the middle ear here. Right, so nice, nice anatomy for those. And this is what we see when we use a little micro endoscope. So that's the round window now. Here, I put a little micro endoscope through a round window. That is an outer diameter. I think it was 0.4 millimeters. And um, we uh, did a little laser cochleostomy here, 
and I take this little tungsten rod electrode, this really rigid electrode, and direct it towards the basal membrane, right? I mean, as you can tell, this is a flexible um, endoscope, so it, it has just, I think the, it has 800 dp, you know, um, resolution, dots resolution period, and, uh, but you can see you're not touching the basal membrane, you're touching the basal membrane, right? So you this associated with a micro manipulator, so you can play back and forth how many times you want, right? So that really allowed us to um, capture the electrophysiologic signature of touching an electrode and re retracting, you know, and, and causing different levels and types of trauma, and they're in, it, it's still in the basal term, but on different parts of the basal term, right? And this is what we found, right? So you can see um, the gerbil cochlea here, the, the the raw signal, right? And that's without touching the basal membrane, with touching the membrane. And then what we do, we have a fa fast Fourier train, uh, you know, um, transfer function where we basically extract the energy out of this signal. All right? So the one we we say, hey, this is the whole energy that's uh, captured in here. And it's just a very common mathematical um, kind of, of equation here. And what you can see before we touch the basal membrane, after touching the basal membrane. And we did the same with the cap, right? If you look at the raw function of the cap, you have the, you know, the cap changes less than the cochlear microphonic, but you would expect that because the cap is really the entire cochlea. So when we saw when we plot those over time, right? So it's just it's just me, you know, moving the electrode forward, advancing the electrode, pushing it back, advancing, moving back, advancing. So we saw a lot of these are reversible. Just again, those are in micrometer steps. But eventually, when we cause enough trauma, and um, the I'm um, sorry, the um, the the blue line is the is the is the um, cochlear microphonic, and the red line is the cap. All right. So we plotted each of these separately and you can see that eventually we cause enough trauma where we we get like less reversible changes than previously right so those were the initial experiments those were done over years we had to write computer algorithm matlab algorithms um you know get the animal stuff uh, really figured out so i'm presenting you that as like a few minutes here but uh, that was years and years of work and then we had a, a lab technician steve and then others too and ken who uh, were really good at the micro dissection. So we basically take the gerbil's head and remove the cochlea as a whole. It's called a whole mount preparation. And you can see those are uh, hair cells, right? You can see how they roll over outer hair, inner hair cells and outer hair cells, and how we basically just eat trauma here. We, we poked multiple holes in it. Right, but it's something that probably likely happens during human cochlear implantation as well. Right, so we correlated what we found in the gerbil uh, during surgery with, uh, you know, post-operative if you want electrophysiology. And one caveat with all those experiments was that you know those were really done in in um, hearing animals. So all these animals had normal hearing, and you know, obviously, a lot of folks, um, in, you know, who we presented this to said, well. It's all nice and and cute, but you know all those patients you operate on, they don't have normal hearing. In fact, they have pretty bad hearing losses to get a cochlear implant, right? And we're like, well, true. So we did an animal experiment. We did um, we we had this box that doesn't have right angles. We put the gerbils in, we anesthetize them and blast them with about 120 dB for about two hours, so they have noise exposed hearing loss. And you wake them up, let them live for another two, three weeks, and then you 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 basically measure ABRs. And then you also look at their cochleas histologically and see if you have preserved hair cells or not, right? And um, uh, so those noise exposure kind of experiments show that, you know, the base is really wiped out, right? And then you have this cutoff filter, right? You have this bandpass filter that cuts the noise off, and then you have preserved apical structures, right? So similar to the sloping hearing loss that we see in a lot of candidates who get um, cochlear implants with hearing preservation, right? So EAS candidate or hybrid candidates, right? So we played around with that for a few years with the noise exposure and did similar experiments uh, in gerbils 
what we also did is we did the longitudinal injury assertions, right? Rather than to get to a round window here and just poke a hole in the basal membrane, we wanted to see what happens if you have a longitudinal insertion along, you know, um, scale of tympany, uh, which would mimic a human uh, configurations, obviously, sorry. And then we played around with different fre st fre um, stimulus frequencies, you know, here at 1 and 16 uh, kilohertz. Again, keep in mind that the gerbil here is still about 60,000 hertz, so a very different kind of uh, frequency arrangement within the cold flip. But the gerbil has very good low frequency here and too, and that's why it's such a such a nice animal for auditory research. And you can see, and we can actually replicate that now, is that in humans that different frequencies have different maxima along the basal membrane, and we can detect that with uh, the gerbil electrode, right? So we can see the CM and then the cap in 16,000 hertz. We hit that maximum much sooner than for 8 kilohertz, for example, right? And there's some things we didn't understand quite then. Now we're looking back and say, hey, this made perfect sense what we did 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, animal experiments are, are remain ongoing in, in the Fitzpatrick lab and at UNC, but, you know, at some point we felt, hey, it was time to give this a go uh, in the operating room, right? And um, so what we did is we um, basically, our montage in the operating room was basically, this is the Oracle, right? It's folded over and we put some ioban over it and this is a sound tube what you use for abrs right it's just a regular sound tubes from it what we used back then was a biologics machine so just conventional equipment and we put the facial lift stimulator on right electrode you you guys probably all know that and we plugged it into our abr machine so instead of stimulating the facial nerve we basically put it in the round window niche and it fits perfectly in most most cases and we uh, used it as a recording probe rather than a stimulator. And interesting, when we did it in cochlear, and again, folks who get a cochlear implant, we just asked the IRB to, to give us a few minutes so we can record these. And what we saw is that, you know, it looks pretty similar than in the, in the gerbil, right? We still had, we used the 500 hertz tone at 90 dB NHL. So that's uh, equals 107 dB SPL. And uh, we can see that we have a compound action potential. And then we have this cochlear microphonic that kept ringing for the duration of the stimulus. And when we extract the frequency, right? We have the 500 hertz, because that's, that's what we stimulate with. But twice the stimulus frequency, we had a nerve signal as well. And that's the auditory nerve neurophonic, right? We see that here in the, in the different um, frequency um, spectra here, right? So we felt that um, uh, we can record it in the operating room. It um, The signal was preserved. And in fact, it looks pretty similar to what happens in a gerbil. So we, we're, we're, pretty, um, we're pretty encouraged by that, right? So that's what we really was sort of our list of things we wanted to figure out, right? Uh, about the potential utility. How can we use this clinically, right? Because that's what, I, frankly, that's what I was interested in in uh, how do we make this part of the cochlear implant, right? So um, we wanted, you know, back then the whole literature on scale location and scale of tympanies, uh, scale of tympanies good, scale of vestibule is bad, right? All that sort of um, developed and evolved. We, I was always interested in hearing and structural preservation. And uh, also what evolved was tip fold over, right? And really that stems from my personal aversion to intraoperative x-rays I, I i just i just feel like it's cumbersome anyways but then we also wanted to see can we predict an audiogram can we predict how the well the patient hears in the operating room right can i go out to the family and tell them hey you know mr xyz was at 50 and now with the electrode in place they're at 70 db right or have i have i as a surgeon succeeded right I hated to hold my breath until they come back a few weeks later and we do an audiogram. Can we predict cochlear implant performance, right? And can we improve surgical consistency? Can surgeons use this as a tool to become better surgeons? And can we use it for CI fitting? So those are all kind of the things that we were interested in looking at. And um, I'm going to go through uh, some of these. But again, what have we learned, right? So let's look first at the extra cochlear ECOG, and that's the one I just showed, right, where the electrode is at the round window, right? 
So likelihood of meaningful EKG recording. That may sound um, superfluous right now, but back in the day, right, I had a lot of folks tell me it won't work in folks who get a cochlear implant and cochlear implant candidates, right? So again, it's extra cochlear EKG. Then we want to compare recording sites and then intracochlear EKG. Uh, what can we do with that, right? So let's start extra cochlear EKG, likelihood of meaningful EKG recordings, right? And in auditory neuroscience, one microvolt is a good signal. Keep that in mind, right? So if we look at uh, these graphs in both children and, uh, and um, uh, so pediatric and adult patients, uh, and we have zero would basically mean one microvolt, right? Which means that on these 123 adults, the vast majority had signals larger than 123, uh, larger than one microvolt, right? We had some that had lower signals, but again, that's extra cochlear at the round window, right? Same in children. So the majority of children have a signal that's larger than one microvolt. And more importantly, the signal even was less than that. The signal remains recordable in almost every subject, right? But if we saw a big variance on the signal, Right, so about 95 to 98 percent of adults and then uh, fewer children, you know, had a good signal. Of note, you know, we look back at the people where we don't really get an EKG signal. Those are folks who get a cochlear implant, but they had meningitis, right, where, it's part, where, where you have some neosification that's starting to happen, or we had for, uh, folks who uh, had radiation. Right, so radiation really isn't that great for the inner ear. Nothing, nothing shocking or new, but uh, it's certainly something uh, we were interested in finding. So the other thing I want to make sure um, that we uh, we cater to was the recording abbreviation. The bigger the signal, the less averaging you need. And as you know from ABRs with audiology, right, it just takes a while to get an ABR, right? And that's because you have surface electrodes that are really far away from where the signal is, is generated. So that's why you need to play the tone a thousand times and average the random brain activity out before you get a good signal, right? So we felt like we obviously don't have the time in the operating room, nor am I patient enough to do that. So the larger the signal, the fewer averaging cycles you need. And sometimes with the clinical implementation, you have like two to 10 averaging cycles. So your, your, the response that you obtain is immediate, right? So a, a good response magnitude is really critical, right? So the likelihood of meaningful EKG recordings is very high, right? It's, it's much greater than 90%, and that, that includes all comers. So everyone who gets a cochlear implant, not just here in preservation candidates. The other thing, and uh, that's jumping maybe a little bit down the road, is can we use EKG at the round window and measure the magnitude and correlate that with post-operative cochlear implant performance? As you all know, it's very hard to predict post-operative outcomes after cochlear implantation. In fact, the most predictive variable that we always use clinically is duration of deafness. But duration of deafness only accounts for about 20% of the variance in adults, right? And it doesn't actually predict it in children, but in children is more of a residual hearing based. But again, keep in mind, the best variable that we have, the best biographical variable is duration of deafness. It's accounting for about 20% of the variance, right? So when you look here, the R square is basically synonymous of the variance and you have an R square of 0.49, and we added more and more patients, we have hundreds of patients now, where the R square is any is about 0.45. Not adding anything else to it, we can predict 50% of the performance almost in adult cochlear implantation. So at least twice as much as the traditional variable used, right? So in just using EcoG, so basically we're measuring the substrate in the cochlea and how well the substrate can receive an electrical signal, right? So it's really a nice surrogate marker probably for the quality of synapse. More recent work has added um, um, age into that equation. And when you when you account for age and EKG total response inside the cochlea, not outside, and this data, these data that I've shown you are outside, you can account for almost 70% of the variance 
of adult coastal implant outcomes. The problem is you already made the decision to go to the coastal implant, right? So it would be great to have a kind of electrocochleography measure before surgery. So then, I mean, ideally, my dream would be to tell patients, hey, with this electrophysiological signature, it, you have an 80 or 90% chance of having a CNC score of X percent, right? And we feel like that would really change the landscape of cochlear implantation. Because if you have someone come into your office and they have 50% CNC, but yet you can almost guarantee them 80%, right? That provides a lot more reassurance for that particular patient, as opposed to tell you telling them, well, the average of adult cochlear implant CNC scores is 60%, right? That doesn't really help you, right? And, and um, yeah. So this is uh, this is again it, uh, adjusting for age, and again that was extra cochlear. It goes as high as um, it goes as high as uh, seventy percent. So an R square adjusted R square of really 0.7. So and again, um, 50, 60 percent by extra cochlear electrocochleography and age. Uh, there's some part that's mediated via cognition. It seems to be a, a surrogate marker for cochlear health. You know, that again captures the, the potential of the electroneural interface. And the remaining variants and the outliers are probably neural patterns, right? I mean, we call it sensor and hearing loss, but it may be a bunch of different buckets. And it's pretty clear if you look at, you know, the pathology of the ear, the, you know, if you look at actual histopathology of hearing of the inner ear and, and, uh, and audiograms, right, that may not always correlate, right? So. Uh, we may just bunch up a bunch of I issues in the inner ear as as sensory hearing loss, right? So, and of course, neural patterns, right? Adult neuropathy, essentially, right? There, and it, it's probably a sliding scale rather than an, an on-off kind of phenomenon. So there are probably different levels of neuropathy that we're seeing, you know. And of course, uh, you know, diving down into these details requires a lot more work. So. And again, there seems to be a good correlation between ECOG, the, the overall magnitude of the response and cochlear implant performance, right? One that always, because really our premise was really intracochlear ECOG, so we we're very interested in comparing recording sites, right? So in, inside the E, inside, sorry, let me get my most mouse pointer. So this is sort of, a, was kind of cumbersome to do it, but this is a right ear, you know, you see facial recess here and, and the ink is, and we use this um, this um, setup really to put an electrode on the promontory right next to the round window, not to mess with stapedial motion here. And then drill a cochleostomy and, uh, and the, and the uh, blue line is inside the cochlea, the EQG signal inside the cochlea, and the, um, the black line is the EQG signal at the round window, right? And you can see, I mean, there's clear difference, right? Uh, sometimes it's two to ten times as large. These are the energy maxima here. So, and we published that again in, in 14, but uh, we've sort of played with this a long time and where to go. It's interesting. Sometimes you can remain extra cochlear, but just open the round window and you get different EcoG signals, right? So you seem to release some micromechanics inside the cochlea that do, do change and do matter, right? And so, again, intracochlear. I mean, the take home really intracochlear seems better than uh, outside the cochlea. And again, intracochlear, we have an easy way to, not an easy, but we have a pretty obvious way to replicate that simply via cochlear implant, right? So how that would work, basically, you, um, you, you, drill, you drill your approach, you take the receiver stimulator, put it in the periosteal pocket behind the ear, and instead of just proceeding with the electrode insertion, you would basically put the magnet on the outside, either in a sterile fashion, in a, in a like, in in a radiological sheath or 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 not, and you basically activate the implant. And um, you know, what we had different iterations of this. This is the AB system that we worked with, and it's in my disclosures. But we basically activate the implant. We play a tone. So there's a little foam tip uh, in 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 the acoustic stimulator in the ear canal that's produced by this and it's triggered. So basically every time we play a tone, it triggers a recording cycle. So that's the trigger, right? And um, so we st we play a tone and we measure hearing. So we basically do a hearing test as we insert the electrode. And that whole thing is plotted as a, as a basically we measure the main portion is the microphonic. 
So we basically look at hair cells as we insert the electrode, right? So that's the cochlear microphonic as a as a surrogate marker for hair cell function, right? So using that, can we predict behavioral thresholds, namely AKA an audiogram using electrocochlography? Because we measure hair cells and hair cells should tell us what's going on with the audiogram, right? So what we basically do is we turn down the stimulus level, right? We reach threshold. And if you reach threshold, you can put a line through that, right? And then that should be um, that should be the stimulus level needed to generate a stimulus, right? And that should be the threshold, which is what we do in auditory neuroscience, right? Most of auditory neuroscience is at threshold, right? So when we do this, this was done across multiple centers, um, and we published that way back. But we really look at um, the accuracy of using EKG to predict a post-operative, ipsilateral post-operative audiogram. And I can tell you without diving too much in detail that we can be, we can uh, obtain an audiogram at about 5 dB accuracy, right? So EKG alone can tell you instead of sitting the patient in a sound booth and doing the audiogram, obviously there's a pediatric benefit to here to this that we can predict the audiogram right and it should integrate intraoperative hearing and again that's all i can control as a surgeon right because you go you go out the patient wakes up and three weeks later they may have lost all the hearing but there's certainly some biological factors that probably play into this right so um again ecog audiogram but you can also obtain this ecog audiogram after surgery in the clinic because right, they can put a stimulus in the patient doesn't have to be asleep for that right the, the electrodes already in right so we're we're looking at some of these uh kind of measures and how we can use electrocochleography in the clinic outside of the operating room right for the, for uh for kind of audiogram prediction etc right so this is how the software the current software has it plotted out you know where you basically have this audiogram but it's nice to, you know, as a surgeon to go out and at least not feel too bad about your hearing preservation surgery and has, have at least some kind of metric for the family, right? So we're pretty good at predicting thresholds, we feel like. Um, and the, the biggie and really why we start this whole project is can we improve electrode insertion, right? Can the surgeon, we're all, sur can the surgeon really learn about this feed from the feedback and improve placement of the electrode, right? Trauma, characteristic frequency, insertion depth, right? And our dream was always, hey, again, we have this electrode that's long enough. And instead of measuring the CT scan out, we just provide enough insertion so we don't damage the inner ear, but also provide maximum electric, sti electric stimulation, right? So um, what we do right now during insertion, so we, we again hook up the uh, implant, we hook it to that device, right? And then we uh, provide continuous recordings, mainly at 500 hertz. There's a new push to 250 hertz, and I mentioned that uh, later. And we plot a curve, right? The, the, the tablet I showed you, um, basically plots the the uh, the EKG response, and we capture events. So the surgeon basically tells you, hey, there are three electrodes in, and you can put that in, and you can annotate it, and we provide verbal feedback to the surgeon. Now we've um, we've changed this. Now we also have an acoustic feedback. So it's basically, you know, as you know from a truck backing up, basically, and um, so there there are several of these uh, kind of been developed, and then after insertion. You know, it's still in the operating room, but after insertion, can you sweep the electrodes? Again, do the threshold search. Can you get the audiogram, right? And that can be done as as you close up, right? Because you have probably 10 minutes or so when you close the, the incision to basically obtain a lot of data. Can you do electrode sweeps to find characteristic frequencies? And um, can you repeat any kind of electrode movement as you coil the electrode in the mastoid and as you close, right? So those are kind of things. And, you know, we found really several patterns. This is, um, you know, the Vanderbilt paper where we looked at uh, several of these. And we also looked at uh, scalar translocation, right, and how what the EcoG um, signature of that kind of change would be, right? So type one type, we call them type one, two, and three in that paper, right? And again, those are this is a Vanderbilt paper, but uh, we collaborated with them. 
and we look at the phase of the signal too, as well as the, the CM amplitude, right? And we saw that um, that ECOG correctly identified scalar position, right? With a sensitivity of a reloc of dislocation in 100%, but it wasn't 100% specific, right? The positive predicted value was 54% and the negative was 100%, right? So we felt, we get some good information from electrocochleography. We need to learn more about just the placement inside the cochlea alone, right? That we could potentially, uh, you know, replace CT scanning, etc. And then, interestingly, as you take the electrode and you you start at the round window, obviously just inside the round window, as you insert the electrode further down and towards the middle turn, you have escalating amplitude, meaning that the electrode, the signal just gets gets. Uh, a better amplitude as you insert, right? And you know, it makes sense because you, you use a 500 hertz stimulus or a 250 hertz stimulus. That 500 hertz uh, characteristic frequency is probably somewhere, um, you know, probably 22 to 25 millimeters into the cochlea, right? And the electrodes we use are probably 24 to 26 millimeters. Some of them are even longer than that, right? So as we escalate amplitudes, we were, were, were approaching source generators in that region of the cochlea, right? It's just some simple tonal topicity. And then if you have a drop of a signal, does it mean we're approaching the characteristic frequency or does it actually mean we're transloc or are we translocating the electrode into scale timpani? Are we causing trauma or are we just approaching characteristic frequency, right? We have a clinical trial to understand this. It's actually not soon, it's ongoing. And um, we correlate with the pre-op audiograms, right? There's less correlation with the post-operative, but there, again, there are some biological factors at play. And uh, we can, we're pretty good about um, determining uh, scale translocations if we use phase and other measures, but there's more to come on that, right? And of course, when you, when you connect it, the connection at the ear is key. So you need to make sure you're actually getting that amount of sound into the patient, right? And it's a loud signal, and you want to get about 90 dB NHL into, into the ear canal in order to, to have a good electrocochleography signal, just because a lot of these patients have quite a bit of hearing loss, right? And again, that was the picture I showed earlier where we just use an IO band. There's a new drape actually we developed that makes it a little easier, and uh, making sure that that sound tube doesn't kink. Usually we just fold that, that IO band around the around the sound tube, you know, and they they have to have a certain length because they're they're standardized, you know, because otherwise what, what you would get in the ear canal may not be exactly what you think, right? So sound delivery in the operating room is absolutely key. Um, you need very simple feedback and actionable feedback, right? As a surgeon, you want to say, hey, what does that actually mean? So uh, not all of that is entirely ironed out, but, you know, there's a lot of things we've learned. And uh, right now it requires a separate person who actually stares at that at the tablet. Sometimes they show it to you. You know, we usually have an audiologist come in. You can do it with a with a scrub tech as well, or a, or the circulator, and uh, and you have to control the electrode and move it slowly, right? So for pre curved electrodes, it's a little harder, right? Free fitting, so lateral wall electrodes certainly makes a lot more sense. And um, you know, maybe there is something we can tell from the ECOG signature and in surgery that would predict the biological responses post-operative, right? So we need some work there, obviously, to to really dive into that kind of topic. What happens? What does it set off? What does the electrode in the cochlea set off? Obviously, as you many of you heard, there's a dexamethasone coated electrodes are sort of uh, coming up and. Uh, needed to understand what happens there. So electrocochleography can just provide a real insight of uh, the, the physiologic responses immediate to the post uh, to the, the electrode insertion. And again, keep in mind, you can obtain these measures after surgery to in the clinic, right? And what is the hearing preservation and overall performance benefit of using this, right? And there are two studies, one from Europe, one from Australia, that have shown a statistically significant hearing preservation benefit a year after surgery. So meaning that if you use electrocochleography during surgery and you look at electrocochleography assisted insertions, right, the patient, statistically speaking, will have a significant um, hearing preservation benefit a year after. But how will they do with the cochlea? So there's a lot that still needs to be ironed out here, right? 
So I, uh, just the last few slides, you know, show some of these patterns, right? Where we have a continuous increase, right? There's no drop. So that means, you know, look at these, look at these uh, magnitudes that we get, like 50 microvolts, right? So you start off at the round when they're really kind of slow, right? A few microvolts. Then and as you insert, right? You, you just have, it's just amazing how, how robust these signals are. As you get re really close to hair cells, right? You get uh, right underneath hair cells, right? And um, this is a drop without recovery where probably you, you, you injured some hair cells and you, you, you've done some damage, right? So as we, we, we see the drop, we, we pull the electrode back, right? But we can't re, um, re uh, you know, produce that, that high amplitude, right? So that's probably not a good thing, indicating probably um, not just imminent, but reversible trauma, right? And then it's a late drop here where we can see, and we do an electrode sweep, but we should say, hey, we used 500 hertz here, right? But with that electrode in that particular patient, we passed 500 hertz. So that's why the signal, you know, peaked at 500 hertz. And then as we as we are on the other side of 500, as we're distal to it, right, we we saw that decrease of the signal amplitude, right? And then some cochlas is just funky, right, where we see this hair cell patch and then nothing, you know, that's uh, here with the frequency sweep where you see a nice just signal here on the on the basal electrodes. Um, certainly something we've seen. It's it's not super common, but certainly not um, not um, something we haven't seen at all. And then as a surgeon, you sort of get a report card, right? Our life's full of these <laughs> these days, it seems like. And uh, we have this report card that, hey, as a surgeon, at least you did what you could in that year, right? You really have this nice, what we call, call a type 1 or type A pattern, right? There's no decrease. You just, and, you know, these are the kind of nodes that we made, how many electrodes are in, and you see how long it takes to put this electrode in, right? There's a, there's like 120 minutes, right? 150, sorry, seconds. So it takes a while. I mean, it, it, it went from electrode insertion during my kind of uh, lifetime or, pra or or adult lifetime, <laughs> went from uh, from this three second kind of just stick the electrodes in and, and, and just be done to something that takes several minutes. Right, and I would argue 150 minutes isn't even that long, right? There's some, we've done some where, where we mess around with five to 10 minutes, right? Where we just really, the, the, the speed of insertion certainly seems to matter, right? A new thing is what we're exploring, and we have actually some animal experiments on it, is uh, using some multi-frequencies uh, for EcoG, so you have these multiple patterns. Obviously, it gets pretty busy here in the insertion graph. It's not just this one little graph that we get. So one option is to us to use 125 or 250 hertz. Uh, another approach is to use multiple frequencies and see what really what happens in the cochlea, right? And as you do these electrode sweeps, this basically means after you've done inserting the electrodes, you sweep each electrode and you see where you have the maximum uh, in, in what characteristic frequencies each electrode contact on. And instead of making assumption at, at fitting, Right, you could potentially fit each electrode contact to that characteristic frequency based on physiology. Right, so this would be one where you have different electrodes here, right, and response amplitudes. Right, where you see you have each electrode has a maximum, right, and then you would just go in and say, hey, this, you know, this electrode should be assigned that frequency, etc. So uh, we can conclude that it's a complex signal, right? Again, it took me multiple years to really understand it, and it's really a surrogate marker for cochlear physiology in a very detailed kind of fashion. It's feasible in most patients, keep that in mind. It's uh, intracochlear signals are much better than extracochlear signals, so there's definitely real value in going inside the cochlea. And there's value because we have a cochlear implant, it goes inside, right? Um, uh, we can predict variance in performance with a cochlear implant, so predict that that cochlear substrate that we're actually stimulating. So we feel uh, there's a lot more work to be done on that end. Um, we can uh, use an audiogram. We can obtain a pretty accurate audiogram with this. Again, keep in mind that for standard, you know, behavioral audiometric testing, the test retest reliability is about five decibels, similar to here. And we need to better understand electrode insertion patterns and what that actually means. Right, so we need to correlate with hearing preservation, scale location, tip foldovers, and maybe down the road with the biological response that the cochlea in that the electrode inside the scale of tympani actually incites, you know, and kicks off. 
So future directions, uh, more device implementation. So again, uh, Advanced Bionics and Kohla corporations have FDA approved uh, versions of this, right? Advanced Bionics is the only company that has a commercial available system, right? Medell also has a system that's not FDA approved, but they're working on that. So I, I think every manufacturer has recognized that, you know, there's potential value in this. Uh, future directions also include multi-frequency stimulation rather than just using one frequ stimulus frequency and multi-electro recording. So just basically obtaining a lot more data at the same time, right? So I think as we see the cochlear implants evolve, you know, and the internal chips evolve and that go actually into the receiver stimulator, we see that those implants will probably be able to record a lot more, right? We do have a, a NIH uh, funded clinical trial uh, it's a multi-center clinical trial in seven centers, so we look forward to uh, learning more about that. And that uh, clinical trial is here, the participating centers are listed on the right-hand side, where we randomize EIS candidates, so folks who are cochlear implant candidates with a lot of residual hearing, into monitored versus conventional insertions, and we use different EQG patterns and, and look at the value that an AIM-2 look at the true value of usable versus non-usable uh, residual hearing on, you know, patient outcomes. And when I say patient outcomes, it's, you know, classic audiometric, audiologic, uh, the measured audio outcomes, but also um, hearing weight of quality of life. So uh, that's ongoing. So we're actively recruiting for that. And I think that's all I had. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The most important slide to contributors, as you know, there are a lot of people who worked on this and um, really quickly point out Doug and Craig again. Um, uh, Doug still at UNC again. Uh, his lab actually hosted most of his experiments in the early stage, but it's still ongoing. And Craig, the chair at WashU, again, we were all at UNC for a long time, and that's sort of where it all sort of started to have off. We personally worked with uh, ABE a lot, so Kant and Leo, both are not there anymore, uh, helped a lot of these device implementation at Ohio State, Vanderbilt, and others. So the list is very long, much longer than here. These are kind of the med students who uh, over the years have worked uh, with this, and residents, I should say, who are, some of them are neurotologists now. Um, so uh, it was just great to have them in the lab and to to learn together about uh, what electrocochlography can potentially do for us. So again, thanks for having me. Thanks, Joshua, for um, organizing everything in just a, a, a excellent fashion. I'll stop presenting here, and uh, I'll be happy to stay on and uh, take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Dunko. I'll open it up in a second to everyone. Um, I I want to just start by opening with a question. I, I was curious if there was ever an echo G signal that you might encounter intraoperatively that would maybe make you decide decide to not implant that patient like you it was predictive in your mind of very unlikely to have uh, you know substantial benefit at all from having the implant you might actually decide not to put in the electrode um, at all and kind of second to that not i would guess it doesn't really make sense for the once the electrode is in because you've already decided on a on a device but is there any circumstance where you might have information from an extra cochlear echo g signal that might tell you, well, I, maybe I should choose this type of device, this perimidialer versus a lateral wall or some change your approach based upon the signal? Well, potentially. So let me ask the, the first question. So would you would you stop implanting someone basically, right? You go in and so we had, again, um, folks who had cochlear um, radiation, a whole head radiation, right? Who um, have lost hearing as, as part of this? Those are really and meningitis patients are, are traditionally viewed as patients who don't do as well with cochlear implants. Um, we still do it, and uh, we certainly had some patients who who didn't um, do well, who had a low EQG signal. So um, we haven't really, you know, used this as a clinical measure to stop from stop us from actually implanting, right? So we would still place the electrode, but um, it's certainly something if we ever have a pre-operative test, right? Not the, not the one that requires us to go in the operating room, then we would potentially do that. And maybe one word to that, you know, when I was a resident in Frankfurt, Germany, right? So what we did back in 20 years ago, uh, I remember that the professor said what we had, we admitted every cochlear implant that was done the next day, you know, the day before. And then we had this these rounds where we had to present all the patients to the professor. 
And part of the presentation was we had to go to the basement and it happened to be in the basement and we stuck a needle through that patient's promontory and turned up the, the juice, you know, electricity. And then the patient would tell us which ear was louder and which they heard it louder, right? So in that year, we would then say, hey, uh, uh, prom stem was louder on the left or right side and that ear would be able to implant, right? <laughs> It's kind of weird and completely irrelevant, I mean, we, but uh, we didn't know at the time, you know, and that was uh, so you can you could certainly envision something like that. Right. And the patients let us do that, even though it was a PGY one or two, you know, they let me stick a needle through their eardrum the day before surgery. So which I thought was fascinating. But yeah. So and then your second question, would you change the device? So um, again, we'd love to have the preoperative, te uh, you know, um, test rather than the intraoperative kind of process. But, you know, we had patients where we had, we want to see that imminent change in the cochlea, right? So, um, and you sometimes you take the electrode out, you change the angle, you rotate it. Uh, could you take a different device? Certainly. But if you see that if you have a lateral, a, a preformed electrode and you can't, it from not translocating up in scale of vestibuli, you could theoretically take it out and put a, put a, uh, put a, um, you know, lateral wall in. Um, I assume the manufacturer wouldn't be happy about it, but you know, you could theoretically do that. None of that is really a clinically accepted uh, kind of uh, way to do things at this point, at least. Thank you. Um, we have a question that came in through the chat uh, from Dr. Vivek Hanamori. He says, amazing talk. And he wonders in this whole process to clinical translation, what have you found to be the most challenging aspect? Well, it's organizing, right? I mean, I don't have a PhD. I mean, I, I had, I always wanted to do research, but, you know, it was just learning, you know, and, and it just takes forever, right? I mean, just, just, I think the most challenging part is just don't lose patience. And I'm inherently impatient. I think actually Eric Formeister is here. So, hey, Eric, so he was, he's, you're part of my slide still. So uh, he probably remembers the early days of this project and hey, man. And uh, so Eric was a med, a med student with us and then um, uh, worked in the lab for a year, right? So he remembers the days when it was sort of slower, right? And it was just, you know, because, you know, it just got to stick with it. And um, it was sort of nice to to see people like Eric and, and uh, you know, we always have two to three, had two to three in the lab at the same time. You know, they, they learned that and um, just, you know, the whole thing, it just takes a while. Right, I think I think my, my biggest to Vivek's question, I would just don't lose patience. I don't know, Eric, what do you think? I mean, it's sort of. Yeah, I mean, this is this was really kind of fascinating to see how when I was a medical student, some of their early studies have actually translated into a commercial product with AB being able to record from it. So um, in my eyes, it's I mean, it seems like the last seven, eight years have just flown by and I'm kind of actually surprised how quickly it became sort of part of the mainstream. But um um, and I, I mean, I feel like technology has variable rates of, you know, quick growth and slow growth. And like you were saying, the, the stuff that Doug did with, with the gerbil model and, and Steve and, and Ken and the others in the lab who just yeah. spent just hours and hours with their, um, uh, you know, sort of micro manipulation. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely a huge team effort. It was um, an awesome experience. It was a really productive year. Um, so, yeah, I think, sorry to kind of... Um, piggyback on that. Thanks for a great talk. I'm really glad that you're continuing this at Ohio State. I'm really excited to see the results of that study. Quick question because um, my co-fellow Desi's on the on the call here as well oh, yeah. um, from uh, from Hopkins, I guess my former co-fellow. Um, with respect to the prom stim, now that we know so much more about the ECOG signal, um, I'm thinking about the scenario where you have you know, an acoustic neuroma, you've resected it, the cochlear nerve is anatomically intact, but you've lost bears and you have no idea if they're going to get any sort of outcome from a cochlear implant. And most people are like, yeah, just, just try. And some people are like, do a prom stim. If they can hear anything, just implant it. What, what would you envision as, um, like, do you have any ideas for kind of how you would apply this in a, in a more finesse way to, to figure out if, if you could, you know, in the clinic, get some type of response that would be like, okay, that nerve is definitely intact and working and this person would be a great candidate. 
Well, I mean, if you if you have uh, if you have an acoustic, right? If you if you do a translab, you you lose that acoustic, the ability to acoustically stimulate, right? So we did it in the translabs just to see when we lose signal and all that. We did over 100 patients. We wrote this up a while back. Um, but if you do a retrosigmal fossa, right, uh, where you don't breach uh, the the integrity of the labyrinth, then um, you could, for example, see if you have a wave one, if you maintain a wave one, right, and delay, you know, you basically haven't cut off the blood supply to the inner ear. We always talk about in acoustics, right? You need to maintain blood supply on the nerve, right? And then in retro sig, we always find it harder to preserve hearing in a retro sig just because you stare at that nerve, you're much more intimately involved with the nerve. The tumors are also bigger. In a middle fossa, you basically just stay away from that inferior compartment in a, in an, in, in, in a tumor and you sort of, keep your fingers crossed, right? But we do uh, use it sometimes as the different components, even of the eight, the far field, but then, you know, sometimes we stuck electrodes through the drum and uh, just to see uh, what part of the signal actually goes away when we lose hearing, right? And and if, I mean, if you if you really lose um, the more, the nerve stuff, right? If you, if you preserve hair cells, but lose, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the truth is, I don't have a good answer for your question other than it's very interesting. I don't. We don't have a, a great process or pro protocol that would allow us to uh, make clinical judgment based on these various scenarios. But it's something that it's. It, I think it's absolutely worth exploring. You know, I, I'm frustrated too. We do a lot of actually implants on acoustics, and we obviously try to do it. You know, it kind of stinks that we're now talking about single-sided deafness kind of treatment with implants but for acoustics which is a common scenario of that you know we really don't have so if you have a small tumor with a good without good hearing we we're our threshold of putting an implant at the same time is really low if we have a larger tumor it's it's sort of high and there's some tumors that are two centimeters or so or we we try it and with mixed results i would say thanks no problem. <clears throat> oliver uh, yes, sir. Something you uh, touched on early on, I think, is really important for trainees to hear. You know, you mentioned how you kind of did not have extensive experience in this area at the time you started your fellowship and your uh, attending career. Do you mind speaking to that? Because I think a lot of people, trainees, assume right that you had studied this since you were seven years old. You're a world yeah. expert, expert in it, but like the ability to gain expertise is there. Even you know, at, even if you haven't developed it in residency or fellowship. You mind uh, commenting on that? Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of comments on that, and I think I tried to mention it earlier, but, you know, um, you know, I had a lab during residency that inherited, and, you know, Germany was a little different, and I, I was just interested. I had a lot of clinical interest, but not a lot of skills, <laughs> and uh, I, I think, you know, I just I just wanted to, to figure this out, you know, and then, um, you know, really when I came out in practice, you know, my my former bosses didn't I had no like research time assigned. I just I just did have a clinic that wasn't full, right? And an or that wasn't full and um uh, had more time at ha on ha at hand and wanted to figure it out and you know, seeked out a lab, you know, and Doug's lab was sort of perfect at the time, you know. But you know, like Doug was busy with other stuff. He's like, Hey, you can do this a little bit. And you know, EcoG is completely taken over his lap. Right, because what he liked is the clinical um, translation. And always keep in mind that when you work with PhDs, you know, for us, it's it, we take it for granted, but a lot of PhDs really love that clinical relevance that we bring to the table. Right, so don't cut yourself. I guess don't don't cut yourself short on that clinical relevance. Really matters, and um, uh, and you know, I always wanted to do something that you know we can have this talk and say, hey. There's like Eric said, you know, there's a pro there's actually a product that came out of that, right? I mean, how cool is that? But uh, I think sticking with it and um, being persistent, having grit, right? And, and frankly, we look at that in fellowship applicants and residency applicants. We look at folks who have grit, right? Who who want to change the world, but if you have the skill or not, I mean, I don't know. Just uh, I mean, all of us are pretty smart, I would think, on the call. We can probably figure things out, right, without having a formal PhD or, or with it, you know. So um, I think I hope that answered your question, um, Teddy. But um, for me, it was always grit and wanting to do something and figuring it out, right? I mean, finding the right people to collaborate with. And if you don't know something, I mean, I, I, again, I did not know anything about electrophysiology. I mean, nothing, right? And then, you know, there was an audiologist at UNC, Pat Roush, and then Doug, and then Craig, too 
they all sort of bits and pieces. I learned bits and pieces, and over the years, I put it in, put it together. I just learn about it, right? But it was not a great, great answer. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I, so I guess unless anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to jump in. But otherwise, I'll say thank you so much, Dr. Duncan, for being here. That was a fantastic talk, and we all really enjoyed it. And um, we appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you, and thanks for having me. And uh, good to see everyone. Great to see you, Eric. So I hope you're doing okay. And um, yeah, as well. If you have any questions, please email me. All right. Take care. Uh,